conflict I was experiencing between science and religion was personal, yes, but it was nothing unique about it. Untold hundreds of thousands or millions of people had gone through a similar conflict in the last century as science became a dominant source in our culture. So science and religion um, come from very different epistemological foundations. Um, religion has a basis in faith, which means it can accept things that can't be empirically proven, can't be seen, can't be felt. And, and the fundamental difference with science is that science moves from uh, an empirical foundation. So we use our senses, our sight particularly, but also our hearing, sometimes our taste even, to um, our touch to sense the world around us and make hypotheses about what may or may not be true and then test them empirically and see if um, we find evidence for our hypothesis. But if you contrast that to what it was reacting to. So if you use Galileo as the exemplar or Kepler or even further back, you know, Fucino and, and Bruno and, and others, they were reacting to the church, right? The power of the church to set the horizon of truth. And that social sort of milieu is important to consider because that was considered the, the dominant arbiter of what's true, what's acceptable, what is the correct cosmology and worldview in which humans exist, how humans make meaning, and how humans suss out what is true. No creo que sea una tensión uh, esencial o necesaria en el sentido de que la ciencia se puede practicar uh, con cosmovisiones y paradigmas mucho más abiertos de pues, como se practica hoy en día y de hecho algunos de los antiguos científicos como Newton pues los científicos del pasado creían en Dios, eran creyentes religiosamente, tenían una cosmovisión muchísimo más amplia que la ciencia moderna naturalista. ¿no? Claro, el naturalismo científico hoy en día es muy eh, narrow, es como estrecho. Se le llama en algunos eh, pues, lugares de discurso como un naturalismo estrecho, ¿no? porque básicamente es un naturalismo que dice todo lo que las ciencias físicas y biológicas no puede demostrar como existente, metodológicamente lo ponemos en paréntesis o lo negamos. Hay distintas posturas y distintos científicos y filósofos de la ciencia lo, lo manejan distinto. ¿no? We have a dominant philosophy of materialism in a lot of parts of the world today. We think consciousness is nothing but the brain. And if you talk about spirits or God or gods or psychic energies and all that, you're just imagining stuff. The brain is good at imagining stuff. But that's all it is, imagination. If you pray, you're basically talking to yourself. And, you know, if you pray out loud, your prayer will go all the way to the walls of the room where it'll get absorbed and go no further. Or one could talk about the difference between scientism and science. Scientism is referring to a rather dogmatic way of holding the scientific endeavor. And that is when we utilize the methods of science, but do so in a calcified set of assumptions that we don't question. The more research I did, the more I saw that um, the way that pregnancy and childbirth had been, you know, uh, conventionally approached in the United States um, was detrimental. And I was a product of the 1950s in the United States, in New York City, which at that time, um, you know, basically put mothers under um, sedation <laughs> during their childbirth and injected the mother's breasts with chemicals so that it would dry up the milk and babies would put on bottle, bottles immediately. Well there's this, there's this notion of progressivism which is a very Judeo-Christian kind of notion um, that people or cultures move from this undeveloped state to this developed state, right? So there's a hierarchy and there's a developmental trajectory and um, you kind of get rid of superstition and then you are more developed. And that idea has 
um, certainly traveled with um, U.S. development aid as well as U.S. missionaries around the world. Um, so again, you know, encountering people who appear undeveloped and saying, oh, okay, well, you know, we're better because we're developed, let us teach you some things. Cartesianismo, el cartesianismo también es la disociación de cuerpo y mente, ¿no? You know? eh, o es una de las, a ver, es una de las raíces conceptuales, ¿no? O quizás unas, incluso mejor, más que una raíz, yo creo que es una articulación conceptual de una vivencia que ya se estaba dando en aquella época, ¿no? Y el, cuerpo, el, claro, el cuerpo está en, el cuerpo es real, está en contacto con la realidad completamente, ¿no? Pero la mente disociada, al disociarse del cuerpo, se disocia de la realidad, se disocia de la realidad. La, la... Entonces, no es de extrañar que esas ideas de dos mundos distintos, uno que está inaccesible y otro que está accesible, vinieron también en la modernidad, ¿no? Porque hay como una doble distancia, una doble separación. Our methods are largely based on the assumption that there is an objective external world and that all of these phenomena that happen, we should be able to study them as objects. And when you're dealing with some of these subtle and uh, exceptional human experiences, they're not necessarily like that. La ciencia, la ciencia es un método, ¿no? Es un método, pero el cientismo, que es esa, esa ideología científica, ¿no? Que, que dice que, bueno, que este método es el, es el realmente el único que nos puede dar un conocimiento sólido ¿no? sobre la realidad, por un lado. Y por otro lado, también es un cientismo que está normalmente asociado con esa ideología del naturalismo estrecho. Entonces, ahí sí que hay un, una tensión con mundos religiosos, ¿no? Cosmovisiones religiosas, religiosas que... Eh, eh, no solo entienden, sino que acceden a, o, o perciben, porque su perspectiva es distinta, la realidad y el mundo de una manera mucho más amplia, más multidimensional, que ese, que ese naturalismo tan estrecho. ¿no? So when you have kind of conventional processes of thinking and information processing, it works pretty well, but when you get to the more subtle processes, mystical experience, spiritual experience, some of these exceptional human experiences, uh, intuitive capacities, that model breaks down. And even though you could say, well, those are kind of, you know, fringy, those are kind of unusual human experiences. Well, they're unusual because people generally are afraid to talk about them. Because they think that somebody's gonna think that maybe they're, they're not entirely emotionally healthy. Um. And so my initial definition was in the Western cultural context, but in other cultural contexts, there may be more harmony between science and religion. Yo, yo no soy muy amigo de las definiciones, ¿no? Porque la, las definiciones cierran, ¿no? Pero yo permito un poco que el significado vaya emergiendo en la investigación colectiva, en contraste con muchas opiniones, ¿no? Cualquier definición de religión va a privilegiar ciertas religiones sobre otras y va a dejar muchos fenómenos espirituales de lado. I think it's crucially important to find a philosophical paradigm within which subject and object are not divided. So to go back to the Cartesian issue, uh, the subject and object are really aspects. It's a, it's a category that we make up. Y en esa, esa división entre lo natural y super, supernatural, ¿no? que ha marcado tanto uh, la, el, o sea, la ciencia y la filosofía occidental, moderna, que en realidad dicen los religiosos espirituales pues están pero teneados con algo que le llaman supernatural, pero la ciencia moderna y filosofía se distingue como algo que, bueno, estamos hablando de cosas que existen en el mundo, el mundo de lo natural y lo demás, de nuevo, lo ponemos entre paréntesis o eso no existe, son pamplinas, ¿no? ¿Vale? Pero claro, eh, esa distinción entre natural y supernatural no existe en otras culturas. Ninguna cultura indígena mantiene esta conexión. Maridoma dice, por ejemplo, dice, está hablando sobre <coughs> visiones de otras realidades, ¿no? Entonces decía... Él es de la tradición Dagara de Burkina Faso en África, ¿no? Y dice, dice en inglés, dice, dice alargar, lo voy a traducir, alargar la visión y habilidades de uno, la visión de esas otras dimensiones de la realidad, dice, no tiene nada de supernatural. Dice, es muy natural ser parte de la naturaleza y participar en una comprensión más amplia de la realidad. <risa> Te haces un poquito la idea, ¿no? La idea es, no es que haya una, un reino 
natural, que es al que todos accedemos, y de pronto un reino supernatural, extraordinario que está por ahí, que, que tal, es simplemente una extensión, una extensión de eh, capacidades que te permite ver profundidades o extensiones o dimensiones de este mundo eh, que existen aquí, ¿no? Esto es un poquito... Exacto, en realidad, claro, o sea, la mayoría, obviamente, la mayoría de pueblos indígenas, eh, o sea, no hay distinción entre religión y vida y estilo de vida. En algunos sí que pues, hay ciertas prácticas y tal, ¿no? que, que pues, requieren una atención y un contexto determinado, pero a nivel conceptual no es que oh, eh, nosotros vivimos así y esta es nuestra religión. No, es que la forma en que viven y, la, y lo religioso, el sentido religioso sagrado de la vida está todo completamente eh, entrelazado y no, no tiene costuras. ¿no? Es como en costuras, ¿no? Es como también en Oriente, ¿no? que no hay distinciones entre religión, filosofía o psicología. ¿no? Y vamos nosotros ahí con las distinciones de filosofía, religión y psicología y aquí es todo, es todo, todo un sistema. ¿no? Um, so my research has been in the Himalayas, in Nepal and Bhutan, which are two countries, first of all, that have never been colonized. Um, and secondly, um, in the areas that I've been working, have a Tibetan Buddhist background. And so that's quite different from a Judeo-Christian background that we find in the U.S. Um, and one of the fundamental tenets of Buddhism is interconnectedness. Um, meaning that all living beings are reliant on each other in some way or another. In Bhutan, particularly, people really feel this strong sense of interconnection to the extent that they don't want to harm insects, even. So, I think in that example you can see an interconnection of um, ecological beliefs, and they wouldn't necessarily term them as ecological beliefs, I'm bringing my Western background to that. Um, but a connection of ecological beliefs and cosmological and religious beliefs all together, really in that, um, that notion of interdependence and interconnection, and that hurting one being in this lifetime has effects on the past and on the future um, and on one's own well-being. Everything had to be sterile. You know, what they were missing was that it's in the non-sterile environment that babies really grow their immune system. You know, that's, that's the natural place in which we live. And interestingly enough, I mean, my, my focus these days is so much on the gut, which so many of us are, are looking at as, as that we actually have more bacteria in us than we do anything at any other cells, you know? So the idea of actually creating sterility is, you know, one of those divergences of the Western medical model that led to all sorts of dysfunction and disease. So out of my experience of you know, the 1950s um, and what I was seeing happen in the 1970s and 80s, it was clear to me that there had to be a different way of nurturing our pregnancies and birthing our babies in natural environments with love and with tenderness, you know, and with honoring the sacred moment of birth. And so um, my pregnancies were about that, were about the sacred process. Um, until the 1960s, black women were not necessarily welcome in white hospitals in northern Florida. These rural black women were, had escaped the medical model that we were subjected to in the white communities. You know, they were allowed to birth their babies at home with nanny midwives um, and breastfeed their babies in a natural way. These were the midwives who held the knowledge. And because they still existed and were so important on the map, um, Florida law still allowed for, for lay midwifery, which was not the case in many states in the United States. Many of the midwives I knew, both from the farm and from South Florida and beyond, Oregon, which was also a place of legal uh, lay midwifery, would oftentimes go to Guatemala and um, El Salvador, um, to Nicaragua, uh, many places in Latin America because they were able to get training from the women there um, in a way that they weren't able to receive in the United States. Um, so this was about really um, breaking through the barriers, the cultural barriers, the color barriers, the socioeconomic barriers, you know, for women to become allies 
to create a new opportunity for women to have humane and loving and sacred births. A person who has mystical experiences and writes about them may have a tremendous shaping influence on a whole culture. So you look at um, Jesus as the, as the, the person around Christianity, uh, Moses, a uh, formative person in Judaism, uh, the Buddha uh, had tremendous influence on Indian culture and many other cultures where Buddhism spread. Um, uh, Muhammad, who had mystical ex experiences and tremendous influence on, uh, on uh, Islamic culture. And so you have these, you know, small but incredibly powerful experiences. And so if you have a system that can't account for these experiences and then instead tries to say, well, let's just sideline them because we can't understand them. Uh, these are so central to human life, individually and culturally, that it's unacceptable uh, to try to make these phenomena conform to the model instead of re-examining the model and saying, how can we have a model that accounts for these phenomena? That different cultures represent different locations in a whole of the human experience of mind. And so, in order to get a better picture of that whole, we have to have participation from different cultures. And there are a number of reasons why that kind of knowledge hasn't been uh, taken into account historically. I would say, in a large part, it has to do with European hegemony and racism, like just pure and simple, like, we know best, we're going to tell you what to do, and you, like, savage natives, don't know what's going on, let us tell you, you know, you're living in the dirt, you're not wearing clothes, you speak something we can't understand, so you probably don't have anything useful to say. But I think there was still the idea that um, knowledge with a basis in Europe and uh, North America was, was better in some way that knowledge, than knowledge that came from somewhere else. And um, people who hold that belief will point to computers and the internet and skyscrapers and highways and trains and say, look at all these things that our knowledge has created. Obviously, it's, it's much better and more effective and more efficient. Um, and I would say, look at, all, look at all those things that it's created and look at all the suffering they cause, actually. Western knowledge isn't the be-all and end-all. Um, and certainly in my own fieldwork in Bhutan and Nepal, I found that people who were living close to the land were content in a certain way that I and my friends here are not. And they may not have all the material things that we have, but they have a sort of ease in their life um, that's largely missing in the U.S. Um, and you see this increasing number of people going to the Himalayas and going to South Asia and going to other parts of the world trying to get some of this um, authenticity. Entonces, claro, hay muchísimo que aprender, por ejemplo, de pueblos indígenas, ¿no? de cómo viven sus temas político-económicos, aunque son situaciones mucho más sencillas y simples de las que nosotros tenemos que lidiar, pero hay mucho que aprender de ellos, ¿no? cómo viven en armonía en, en, en grupos, cómo comparten incluso a veces paternidad o maternidad con, ¿sabes? Uh, niños, hay a nivel este, desde relaciones íntimas hasta sistemas económicos, hasta relaciones con el mundo natural que hoy, hoy en día son obviamente importantes, hasta pues eso, ¿no? cuestiones más filosóficas y, de, y espirituales. ¿no? Hay un antropólogo brasileño que me gusta mucho, se llama Eduardo Viveiros de Castro, te gustaría, y habla de la importancia de esas relaciones simétricas, ¿no? que la antropología y las epistemologías de los pueblos indígenas se encuentren como iguales. No, esto es un poquito lo que hablábamos también en el giro participativo. ¿no? Se ven como iguales, no desde esa perspectiva del antropólogo que es intrínsecamente superior, estudia a los pueblos indígenas cuáles son sus creencias ¿no? como objetos de investigación. ¿no? Y nunca se siente que esas creencias van a desafiar su propia perspectiva. Hello. Yo creo que un poco el momento postcolonial en la investigación, para mí lo más interesante es esto, ¿no? Es como, es como darse cuenta de que esas creencias o sea, una, una, son perspectivas, 
no es, no es, una, no es un algo en, en lo que creen, es algo desde lo que creen. Es una, es una, es una ventana, una, una, una creación o una creación del mundo de la realidad. Pero ¿no? algo in en esta kind of cultura, growing up en esta cultura, where one realizes that there's more to life than the kind of uh, particle-driven, um, uh, unconnected, disconnected, scientific um, perspective that we're given in this culture. That the world is actually an interconnected, alive, sacred experience. Uh, that's why people start doing meditation or start doing yoga or you know whatever it is where they feel driven to pursue that glimpse of interconnected aliveness and sacredness because in my experience that's what makes us feel truly alive and that's what traditional cultures have been able to to retain that we are desperate to connect back into see they, they see the community as the world Their community is not just the people that they hang out with and people live with. It's all one. We're all one. We're all connected. We're all, you know, it's that web of life that connects everything. That, you know, you and I are connected. People in Russia are connected with us. That there's, you know, there's. They don't have this so much the dualistic thing. You know, us and them. That we are all one. We are all human beings. We're all part of life. They see. You know, there's a life force in everything, the rocks, the trees, the water, the air. Probably around 1950, somewhere there, where they came down from the mountain, they saw what was happening. They saw the pollution in the air, they saw the glaciers melting, and they said, we need to go down and share our, our knowledge, our wisdom. And so they, I know, made a conscious effort to do that. There's, uh, I know when I go to Russia, I've met with several Siberian shamans that kind of the same thing, where it's really important. They'll, they'll work with Westerners that want to learn about the shamanic ways. They do come and give talks and do workshops because they see it's really important that the world as it has been is going on a destructive curve. We have to have multicultural content within a multicultural context. We can't just have sort of a Western context and say, okay, so these Western people, they're going to talk about all the other cultures and then that's multicultural. No, it isn't. That's, the, that's what multicultural looks like from a Western perspective. We have to have is a diverse container for diverse experiences and then out of that dialogue, what can we learn about the many ways of being human? Pero como perspectivas abiertas que 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 lleven al diálogo y afirmen y legitimicen, ¿no? Una pluralidad de cosmovisiones y de conocimientos y de epistemologías, ponerlas en diálogo y y de todo saber qué saldrá de ahí, ¿no? A lo mejor pues que de, del diablo saldrá que algunas están más equivocadas que otras y unas valen para una cosa y no para otra. Hay distintos dominios de de la realidad, yo qué sé, miles de cosas, ¿no? Pero, pero ese diálogo aún tiene que ocurrir. Es que nunca ha ocurrido un diálogo simétrico. Y eso yo creo que es un poco, yo creo que sería uno de los grandes frutos de todo este pensamiento postcolonial a nivel profundo. No, no simplemente oh, vamos a tratar mejor a los nativos en la investigación. No, vamos a abrirnos a que sus, sus conocimientos y sus marcos conceptuales, y sus categorías de la realidad y sus formas de validar el conocimiento sean también como potencialmente enriquecedores de los nuestros o incluso desafiantes, ¿no? que desafíen nuestros presupuestos, nos podemos abrir a eso. Exacto. Y de ahí también la idea, me encanta esta idea, en África crearon una pluriversidad, en lugar de la universidad, fíjate, universidad, ¿no? es esta, esa idea de la unidad, de ese, de ese, de ese, está en la propia palabra universidad, ¿no? entonces en África crearon lo que se llama de pluriversity, un poco para honrar cosmovisiones distintas, pluralidad de conocimientos, ¿no? Exacto, como dicen los zapatistas, un mundo... Queremos un mundo en que todos quepan, ¿no? Queremos un mundo donde quepan muchos mundos. Donde quepan muchos mundos, claro. Sí, sí.